Hmm? Ah. Huh. I, at one point, we had moved to another apartment and there was an antenna on our roof and we couldn't get any television. And I was close enough to the base that I was hoping that maybe we could get the U.S. television. So I, I go downstairs and I, I, I unscrew this box and there's a little connector and I, I connect the thing. And turns out I turned on cable for the whole building. And um, <laughs> they were happy until the you know German Bundespost showed up and changed that. But, um, you know, it's always been it's been there to do my bidding, you know. And it's it's been there to make my life easier, there to make my life more fun. And, and I think then naturally all this stuff comes to play. So I, I actually met, and Audible's in the news this week again, but I actually met the CEO of Audible back in 2000. Mm-hmm. And um, I was just about to do my first training product for the, the product Microsoft front page. And I asked him, I said, what would it take for me to put my training product on Audible? He's like, oh, we got this program. It's no problem. Starts out at $500,000. <laughs> yeah, that's not where I start. That's that's not where I start out. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I have a hard time with $5 sometimes, you know? Wow. Podcast Junkies, episode 86. If you are new to the show, welcome, 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 podcast fans, one and all. Fellow podcast junkies, podcast fans, aficionados, raving podcast lunatics, you are all welcome here. And I imagine it's because you just love not only the podcasts, but the personalities behind the microphone. And we do that every week. We being me and my microphone and my Yorkie disco, who thankfully is not barking today. Yes, it's Podcast Junkies, and it's one person. Weird. I know. I know a lot of people say, hey, guys, fantastic job uh, on the show. And I say, thanks, all of us here at Podcast Junkies headquarters. Thank you. But I digress. In case you missed last week's episode, we spoke to Ben Adair of First Time Last Time. It was a live interview, and I'm starting to dig those. We went to the local pub. Not really, it's a restaurant, but we went there and we had a beer or a pint and it was uh, relaxed. There was ambient noise, some music playing in the background. I'd be interested to see if anyone caught any of the actual songs that were playing. Um, There's a couple of noticeable ones if you're paying attention, which are funny. And uh, if if you do, if you did hear one of those songs, then uh, let me know, just tweet at me. And uh, I, I just liked the conversation that we had because it's there's something about being face to face with a person that's more intimate and focuses focuses your attention and makes you put all um everything that you have on the guest so that you're getting the most out of it and that you're you're sh- demonstrating to them that you're paying attention so that was a, a great interview again check that out podcastjunkies.com slash 85 and uh check it out and let me know what you thought of it so this week we speak to another podcast veteran. There's tons of them out there. I'm only beginning to scratch the surface. I've got a lot more on my list. And I think when the timing is right and when the stars align, then they'll end up on Podcast Junkies. So uh, this week I speak to Paul Colligan. And Paul has been podcasting since 2005. He is just a a huge fan and huge... um, ambassador for podcasting and and we actually kick off the conversation with uh about his recent trip to oman which i thought was really fascinating i saw some him write something about that on the the website and it seemed like a good enough jumping point uh jumping off point as any and we just went from there and we started talking about his life growing up in germany for about eight years Uh, this is pre-berlin wall coming down and what fascinating experiences he's he's had and a couple of highlights from his time there where he got the the bug for technology uh he tells a little a little story about how he actually went to the prom in france i don't know how many people can say that but uh, it's just fascinating when someone has that perspective of having lived abroad i just feel that their stories are are that much more uh, entertaining enriching and uh, Paul definitely definitely did not disappoint. He went in, uh, in in more detail about his trip to Oman and and how that they have an active 
community of social media users and, and people who are doing social media for their companies. And a lot of what he was talking about was resonating with them, which fascinated him and obviously fascinated me as well. And we also talk about uh, the importance of mentors and one in particular that uh, has resonated with him. And he talked about uh, his friend, Mike. And we also talk about mindsets in terms of um, whether or not it's a good thing to profit from your podcast. And and I think you'll pretty quickly figure out which side of the fence we both come on, come down upon. And, you know, it's why we think it's not like, and it, it isn't different from any other creative adventure. So um, fascinating discussion there. So I really hope you enjoyed the, the conversation with Paul. I, I think uh, we only had about an hour and with someone like Paul, you just have to pick a, a jumping off point and then see how deep you can go because I, he's really entertaining. He, he gets in depth on, on specific topics, which is fascinating. And as a host, it's always entertaining when you can have someone just talk at length and, and, and demonstrate how passionate they are about something. And we could have probably picked 10 more topics and gone a full hour on each one of those. So I'm, I'm happy I finally got a chance to engage with him. Um, he's a well-respected uh, member of the podcasting family. And um, I'm, I hope you learn a little bit more about Paul and uh, a little bit of a history lesson for those of you that don't know him. So onward with my interview with uh, Paul Culligan. Enjoy. So Paul Culligan, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Long overdue appearance on Podcast Junkies. Well, I figure if I, if I can't show up to any, you know, I mean, it is the Podcast Junkie show. So I, I think I'm morally obligated after 10 years to be doing that. <laughs> I think um, it's just a matter of getting caught up to folks in the space. And just when you think you're, you're, you're getting folks on that you've been eyeing for a long time, then there's like a whole batch of others and people that are well-respected in the space like yourself. Um, and it's just one of those things like it, it seems like it was just we never had a chance to formally connect. And I, you've been on my radar for the longest time. Oh, ever. You as well. So uh, I'm happy to, to chat for a little bit. Thanks. Fun to be on the show. Um, so uh, we were discussing a bit, um, about your recent trip to Oman. So I, I thought we'd kick off with that. Um, it, you seem to have been, um, amazed at, uh, some of the stuff that we have in common and some of the stuff that's different, obviously from a cultural perspective, I've seen some of the photos you were posting on Instagram as well. I'm wondering, um, how, what, what impact that experience has had on you, um, in, in terms of how you see life here in the States compared to, to the cultural differences over there. Man, th there's a ton of stuff. This is an unpacking that's going to be happening for the next couple of years. Um, long and short of it, I was reached out to by the U.S. State Department. They have a public diplomacy program, and they wanted to know if I would come and speak to the whole world of uh, social media, YouTube video, all those things. And... Um, had a sure why not they paid for the ticket they paid for the hotel they they gave me a, a a small honorarium but it was really more the trip than anything else um as a as a speaker i'm always interested in fascinating things to put on my uh, resume and and of course uh us state department is is always a fascinating um um employer if you will and um went over there not really sure what to expect um you know the country oil so they got money yeah. you, you know that that's not a problem um, relatively uh, culturally not as as extreme as some of the other ones with the the anti-American sentiment and that type of thing wasn't worried at all. Had a friend who does a lot of work over in that part of the world. He said, "Oh, Paul, you're going to be more safe there than you're going to be in downtown Portland." So, especially if you're a guest of the embassy, there's there's the political implications of that. So, went um, had a great time, uh, but what was interesting was, you know, I I decided I would share. The American experience, I would share my experience, I would speak to it as the American experience, and then maybe it's coming for them, maybe they can learn from our mistakes, maybe, I don't know. But what was funny was I would start getting these, these nods of recognition, these nods of yes, yes, yes. Um, the first night was, was perhaps my, my favorite um, place, it was a place called The Lounge, and it was, it was a um, shared workspace for artistic, creative 
Omani entrepreneurs. Okay. And yeah, exactly. And um, and so went was speaking to YouTube, and was that was the topic they wanted to to chat about. And I'd mentioned that um, you, you know, we have this problem in America where somebody will take a commercial that nobody wants to watch, and then they'll put it on YouTube, and then then they want to know how come they haven't gone viral. And I saw this gal in the back of the room just nod her head in absolute recognition of the experience. Just, I could tell. Well, during Q&A, she says she's the social media director for Omani Oil, one of the largest Omani oil organizations. And, you know, here we are halfway across the world, the same exact thing. They're giving her the commercials. They're telling her to put it on YouTube. They're expecting results. She's explaining that we can't. And although culturally different, clothes different, world different, time zone different, the same exact thing. And I did another session on um, for the American um, Omani Business Council, and I was speaking to having a social media strategy. And one of the things I said was that um, until you have a strategy, you can't get upset that your social media people aren't seeing results. You know, until you know what you want, you, you can't tell if you get it or not. And there were these four in the front row that were just, yes, yes, yes. And they were taking pictures of the slides and they were so excited. You know, it turns out they were all social media directors and they were like, you know, oh, you know, the big, big hotshot American came and, and, you know, validated us. But the fact of the matter was they've all been doing this. Yeah. And, and the thing is, if you think about it, I mean, that is the power of this space. And, and podcasting specifically, if, if anything, you know, podcasting should be more universal than any of these because we don't have the issues of, um, you know, uh, download speeds and, and connectivity. And, you know, if our MP3 download takes a few more minutes to download, we're, we're fine. We can still go for our walk. And so the food different, the culture different, the language different, the landscape different, but the needs and the expectations, the desires of both the, the workers and those working the workers was was exactly the same. You know, and, and those moments of recognition were, were the same presentations I've gotten at past podcast expos, you know, local presentations I've done here in Portland, and, and it was just um, surprising that way. What does that tell you about how connected we in fact are. I mean, we talk about it all the time. We're in like a connected world and the internet is bringing everyone closer. But a lot for the majority of people, it's just stuff we read about in an article because a lot of people don't even leave the United States, much yeah. less their own town. There's people that yeah. have never even left their hometown. So I'm wondering, yeah. having had a chance to experience it firsthand, did, was it different from uh, for you actually experiencing that that was actually happening? Definitely, definitely. And... You know, when you think of your podcast audience, you know, if you're lucky enough to have ever met your audience, you know, I um, I like to go to as many of the podcast events as I can, you know, and 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 I meet the podcasters and, you know, I meet the old timers. We, we have this vision in our head of, of who our audience is. And in many cases, that vision in our head, you, you know, they look a lot like us, you know, and, and the idea that, that the entire world is actually consuming what we're what we're listening to should be invigorating. It should be exciting, you know, and then the fact that we have this common language should just be electrifying. Yeah. You know, I had a chance uh, a couple of years ago, I, I got to speak at a, at a big event in New York with um, um, uh, Huffington was there. Um, Steve Forbes was there, you know, it was, it was some big players and, and my, my client was running it and he wanted me to speak about their podcast a little bit. He wanted me to find something unique about the podcast that would be interesting other than it's just a podcast, you know? So I was going through the Libsyn stats for this, this podcast and they had, you know, three, four dozen downloads from the country of Turkmenistan. And, and I know nothing about Turkmenistan. So, so I looked it up. And the first thing to come up in Google was the um, freedom of the press report, you know, and they had the worst freedom of the press. The, the second link was the CIA fact book about all the terrible things they've done to their people. I do a little bit more research. Only 5% of the country is connected. Um, it's still run by the Russians. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's Turkmen online. It's all this crazy thing. Now, they've made YouTube illegal. They've made Facebook illegal, Twitter illegal, VPNs are illegal. But podcasting's getting through. <laughs> that blew my mind. Wow. You know, and yeah, exactly. It was it just invigorating. And someone in this country is downloading these entrepreneurial how-to MP3s, you know, and, and, and not just one or two, you know, three, four dozen times. Uh, pretty exciting. 
And, and the idea that, that we've got the entire world as an audience is there, you know, podcasters, we tend to, um, you know, act or feel sometimes like it's Google's job to bring us more of an audience. And, and you know, maybe we should stop look, look, looking to, to, to Google or to Microsoft, maybe start looking to the, to the countries. And then, of course, service, you, you know, then you got to change. Like, okay, you know, you know, Libsyn's a great place to host your podcast if you're here in the U.S., but, but what is – what is the relationship with Oman? Do, do we have PayPal? What, you know, what do we do? And, and things to look up. And I think as, as a podcaster kind of expands my responsibility a little bit. It seems like there'd be a whole business around people who help people in other countries want to get uh, podcasting up and running. And, and a lot of the things that we take for granted here about how easy it is to do. I mean, you can't go 10 feet in this space now with bump, without bumping into an online course yep. Or, yep. Or, or an ebook about podcasting. So, yep. But I, I, I think what you, what you may have seen is that it's not as prevalent, although it, it is becoming more prevalent. There's probably some sort of opportunity for someone to become a specialist and saying, you know, oh, yeah. international podcast specialist. Yep. Man of intrigue, or something like that. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, the, iTunes has how many stores? Like yeah. forty-six different stores. You yeah. know, and we're always looking at the at the U.S. flag charts. You know, who's who's? I don't think Oman has a store, but I, I you know, Middle East does, and and uh, you know, who's doing well there, and 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 what are the numbers there? And and it was funny. I I shared um, in Oman, particularly mobile data is still pretty expensive. And um, it's an issue of the sultan of the country owns a good chunk of the uh, telecom. So um, um, actually Skype is blocked. Um, mm. um, YouTube, Facebook, all these are open, but Skype is blocked because of the long distance business that it, it, it represents. Um, but I, I spoke to podcasting and I just said, I realize it's not a big thing here. But they were intrigued by it, and I saw notes, and I saw questions, and you, you know, and and the idea, the power of what it represented, is is universal, you know, yeah. and and boy, everybody in that room was, you know, nobody. I guess you don't really pull out a flip phone, but you know, anybody who took pictures of my slides, they were smartphones, and you know, a good chunk of them were, you know, the iTunes to Android relationship is about what it is anywhere else. You know, and um, the the hotel I was at, um, I have T-Mobile, so we get Wi-Fi calling for free. The hotel I was at had fantastic Wi-Fi, and you know, my wife would call me just like a local number, and it, it sounded fantastic. And you know, so yeah, culturally it's there, but but technologically it's 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 not. You know, and and um, yeah, I'm I'm still the implications, and of course now you know in Twitter I'm getting um, tweets in Arabic. Wow. You know, I'm getting comments in Instagram in Arabic. You know, I'm getting all these and um, yeah, Google Translate and Bing Translate, sort of. You know, I'm, I'm getting some general ideas, but it's there. And then the other, um, I, I met one gal who is a local YouTube celebrity, but she's a local YouTube celebrity, kind of famous for not showing her face. Mm. And, um, yeah, and, and there's some cultural issues there and there's some interesting things there, but you know, I mean, I was in, everybody in the room knew her, everybody in the room adored her and I know why she was fantastic. And, um, you know, we did the presentation with, with, with no video and no cameras running and you'll see pictures of me, but they're all aimed not to show her face. And it's just a, a, a private choice that, that she's made. And I just wanted to encourage her if it's a, you know, you know, if it's, if it's anything real, um, continue to hide your face. But if you're, you, you know, if you don't think you are of value or of worth, you know, show your face to the world because it's, it's, it's beautiful and wonderful. And, and, uh, but, but what was amazing was, you know, we're, we're in this room and because we had YouTube as the common language and just because we had social and online media as a common language, we began to joke around and towards the end, she says, she says, okay, Paul, um, the elephant in the room, it's time to ask you the question, you know? And, and, and I, I said, you can ask me about Donald Trump, aren't you? You know, she said, "Yep." What do we think about Donald Trump? You know, and my um, my handler from the embassy was um, nervous. You could see in the eyes they were a little bit worried about what I was going to say. And um, um, and then another representative from the embassy was there. Both of them were kind of uh, nervous. And I started with the token. What I'm about to say is, you know, Paul Culligan, American citizen, not representative of the embassy, not representative of the State Department, but. You know, I, I, I gave my answer, and, and what was amazing was when it was over with, my uh, handler from the embassy and my handler from state both said, that's great, Paul. 
Um, this is the type of international dialogue that needs to happen. And, you know, if this Internet thing doesn't work, consider, you know, working foreign service. And, and um, so she felt like she could joke with me. So I felt like I could joke with her. And we had this common dialogue and discourse. And, yeah, I'm, I'm still wrapping my mind around it. I'm still, um, you know, and, and, and so there's the tech side of it. Then, then you have the um, then you have the money side of it, you know. Yeah. Um, this wasn't cheap, you know. My my honorarium was 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 very tiny, but the you know a international business class plane ticket that you can change at any point in case there's problems in the east is not cheap. The hotel was not cheap, so state spent a chunk of change, and I and I appreciate it. I'm, I'm not complaining, but I'm just saying um, the, the money was in a different place. Typically, I'll go to an event, you know, I'll go to a podcast movement or I'll go to a podcast expo or I'll go to one of these things and I'll kind of boot my, I'll kind of pay my own way because of the business that being there might represent. Well, in the Middle East, when the State Department brings the goods, you you know, it was like not, you know, when can we have you back? It's when is Uncle Sam going to pay for you to come back? You know, you know, and not from a not from a lazy standpoint, but just from a that was how I was delivered, you, you know. And so the whole concept of uh, interacting w- with me as a business wasn't necessarily there. So what does that mean? You know, but I was in a oh man, I spent about an hour in a government sponsored virtual reality um, startup. That was teaching the Omni the Omni people how to do virtual reality programming so that they can build training to work better on the oil rigs, you know. And I was using an Oculus to kind of walk around in an oil rig, and it was just it, it was wow. mind blowing. Now the guy who ran that was not from Oman, obviously. He was some some Asian descent, and he gave me his card. You know, he says, "Hey, let's let's chat about training, and 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 maybe we can do something together." So so that happened, but it was just yeah, just internationally fascinating and. You know, but one of the presentations I did, they asked me for for what I thought of the future, and I was um, I was doing my, my homework and and the PayPal rates they pay PayPal the same exact rates you and I pay, hmm. same exact rates, and um, Fiverr, which is a very popular online service of of, of services, um, I just typed in Oman and there were thirty forty different people from Oman providing services, you know, through Fiverr. Um, I went to the market and incense, uh, frankincense, which I'd always heard of. It's all over the place. It was a big thing. And here I am thinking I have to go to Oman to get my frankincense. But then I realized it's on Etsy, just like <laughs> everything else is, you know. And so, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I, I expect I'll probably get an email in a couple of weeks from some Omani p- podcaster who started. And, and um, you know, they look to America for and one of the big questions was, how do I get an American audience? How do I get a Western audience? But. You know, the power of podcasting and, and the power of what we do is is we get our little niche audiences and we get the people who care about what we care about and not, you know, that's where the power of all this stuff is. So who knows? You know, you know have me back in a year and maybe I'll figure this out. But I did just get back Friday and, and jet lag still kicking in. I'm so. sure. There's, I think there's a lot and it speaks to your ability to um, – to have this passion for educating people. You know, if you listen to your podcast, which I highly recommend folks do who don't already, um, you structure each one almost as, as if it's an individual classroom. You're really focused about what you want uh, folks to get out of that specific episode. You're, v- you're very clear with your calls to action, driving people to your downloads, your, your PDFs. Uh, I think I've downloaded about three or four of them already. <laughs> and um, I, I wonder like where the that aspect of of trying to educate people and teach people i know it exists with podcasting but where was the the start of that uh from you in in your background in in terms of teaching and and wanting to educate people well my dad's a teacher so that probably is part of it um i've always had that passion inside of me um tech has always been to me not the tech in and of itself, but what the tech allows me to do. You know, I was on the internet before the web. I actually back there on the bookshelf behind my screens. I have a copy of the uh, the Beginner's Guide to the Internet. It's about that thick. And it has, you know, two whole paragraphs about the web. It came out, this book came out before the web. You know, when I first played, it was uh, it was newsletters and um, gopher systems. And kids, go ahead and uh, look that up on the Wikipedia. And... Um, 
I had this email newsletter. It was it, it was it was political. So so funny that I go from a political newsletter to answering questions about um, you know um, Trump in, in in Oman on behalf of the State Department. But um, it let me play newspaper boy. You know if you know I, I think everybody wants to run a magazine at some point in their life. But the idea of of running you, you know the printing press and paying for the printing and the mailing and that kind of stuff made it you know undoable. But but I could do email. I could do email for free. And then when the web popped up, I really saw it to be a, um, a place where people could find out more about my newsletter. It was really how it started. And then the interactivity and the things that came into play. But it was always, it was always the story of leveraging yourself. You know, I can go, I can teach, you know, I could call the local chamber of commerce and say, let's do a podcasting session. And they'd love it. And, you know, they'd embrace it and they'd thank me for it. And, you know, 20 people would show up. But if I do a podcast um, in the comfort of my own home and I send that out to the entire world, you, you know, thousands can download that. And, um, you know, that game's very, very, very different. And, you know, I think teachers love to see their students do stuff. So, so when you see someone emulate you, copy you, um, do what you recommended doing, it's, it's good to go. I also think it's a format. You know, the, the, the problem, the other great podcast teacher in my life was Grandma you know, who always said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And, you know, we have so many podcasters who, you know, pull down the microphone and we start recording and we blab for about six hours. And then they, you know, then we post the description of our show. It's, you know, you know, two fat guys talking about nothing. And and then we wonder why we don't get any listeners, you know, and, and uh, the power here is not two fat guys talking about nothing, but really nicheifying and really going down to what it is that you can do. I've always seen podcasting as empowering. I, I get frustrated with some of my um, contemporaries who, who who love the tech more than the message. Yeah. You, you know, to me, it's all about getting the message out the door. One of my proudest moments in podcasting, um, there was this event a couple of months ago, or maybe it was a month ago, called PodFest, and uh, I, I heard David Jackson from the School of Podcasting give his recording, and you know, Dave said, sometimes Paul sounds like he's recording from a submarine, but I still listen to his stuff, you know, and that's exactly the message that I try to portray. So, you, you know, I have people come to me, uh, I just had one student right before we got on to do this interview, I teach this whole idea called ease casting, you know, and, and ease casting is, is you got to podcast in a way that's easy to you, yeah. you know, and, and, and some easy is setting everything up. Some is having the, the video production company come in and just knock out something over the course of the weekend or, or whatever it is. And, and this guy was just thanking me for making it easy. And he bought every book, he bought every, everything. And I think his contribution to the world is going to be pretty fabulous. And if somebody told him that, you know, until you understand the difference between the Fraunhofer you know, uh, compressor versus the, you know, lame, lame compressor, you know, and, um, you know, until you spend at least $2,000 on a microphone, you're not allowed to call yourself a podcaster. I think that would truly stop some of the greats, you know, and for those of us who've been this in a long time, we didn't have all these um, smart people to tell us we were doing it wrong, you, you know, but, but, but we started with cheap, cheap, cheap microphones, you know, and we started with, um, you know, all these, you um, uh, we were just happy we could make an MP3, let alone the the, the codex shootout, you know. And um, yeah, so I just like to teach people and empower people because that's what it's done for me. So the 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 fact that you were did you have that book about the um, the history or the education beginner's of, guide uh, to the beginner, internet beginner's guide to the internet. What is your earliest recollection of you interacting with some sort of technology? Well, okay, so I grew up. In Germany, hmm. my folks worked for the U.S. military, and the, the the system over there. There's a base, and you can have on base housing. But my dad was always an adventuresome type, and uh, we always lived off base. And so we lived in 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 a, in a German apartment, and we had German television, which starts at about six o'clock at night, and it's not in English. And so, you know, I was not like the kid who woke up, you know, comes home from school and, and watches the, the, the cartoon reruns of Popeye. Didn't have much. Um, this thing called the Timex Sinclair, you know, 2000, this 2K computer that was $250, um, got one and got the manual that came with it and hooked it up to my black and white television set and started from there and... About a year later, my, my high school on the base got some Atari 800 computers, and um, nobody even knew how to set them up. So I, I came in and sat them up, and I, um, 
I had a, a, a programming teacher in high school who, you know, was learning everything out of a book basically one day before the students were. And he issued this challenge that I was able, you know, he said, if anybody can accomplish this challenge, you get an A for the entire year. And I did it on day three of programming class. So every day I went to school, I had a computer and books and I'd program and I'd, I'd learn all this stuff. And so it was always very, very empowering. I remember my dad told me about college and, and he tells me that, um, you know, in, you know, college is about these mean professors who won't read your writing if your margins are off. You know, and, and the old typewriting and, 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 and if you have to add a paragraph on page three, you have to retype everything. Well, when I got my first word processor, I realized, wait a minute, I can add something in paragraph three and reprint it on my dot matrix printer. And, and if the teacher doesn't like the margins, I can adjust the margins. You know, and I, I realize now I can focus on my writing where my, where my poor dad had to focus on his margins. You know, and, uh, you know, and then I realized I could I could save things and archive things and, and um, focus about what was important. So text been a part of me since the, the very beginning. Um, I at one point we'd moved to another apartment and there was an antenna on our roof and we couldn't get any television. And I was close enough to the base that I was hoping that maybe we could get the U S television. So I, I go downstairs and I, I, I unscrew this box and there's a little connector and I, I connect the thing. And turns out I turned on cable for the whole building and, um, <laughs> they were happy until the, you know, German Bundes post showed up and changed that. But, um, you know, it's always been, it's been there to do my bidding, you know, and it's it's been there to make my life easier, there to make my life more fun, and and I think then naturally all this stuff comes to play. So I, I actually met, and Audible's in the news this week again, but I actually met the CEO of Audible back in 2000, mm -hmm. and um, I was just about to do my first training product for the, the product Microsoft front page, and I asked him, I said, what would it take for me to put my training product on Audible? He's like, oh, we got this program. It's no problem. Starts out at $500,000. <laughs> yeah, that's not where I start. That's that's not where I start out. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I have a hard time with $5 sometimes, you know? Wow. And um, so that was 2000. And then when podcasting pops up, 04, 05, my mind was never – Oh, this is great that we have the enclosure tags on the RSS schema. You know, I was always, wait a minute, I can play, you know, Audible. And Audible, who had done this amazing, impressive technological wonder of getting 70% of all the devices to be Audible ready, you know, this MP3 thing was universal and it was on every device. And, and so from the very beginning, my mind was, um, we got to do something here. And I, I did a show called Marketing Online Live where me and my partner, Alex, we'd literally just get on the microphones, do the Skype double ender, and just kind of work through what it was, what this meant, what do we do. Um, Alex was, was, was the technophobe, and, and, and he played that role well. And one of the big things was back then, the iPods were so locked up, you know, they, they were so crazily locked up that we were chatting about um, – you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could unlock them and if speakers could preload MP3 players and how empowering that would be? And uh, so I go to my first podcast expo and a guy named Dan Safkow comes up to me, you know, and, and he introduces himself to me and he says, hey, my name's Dan. And, and what do you do, Dan? He goes, well, actually, I run a company where I um, make preloaded media players for um, gurus and, and, and trainers to, to put their media on. And I'm like, that's crazy. I wish I'd known about you when we were doing the show. He says, no, I... I got the idea from your show. <laughs> like, you launched a company based on me and Alex just trying to figure this stuff out? Yeah. Wow. You're either gutsy or nuts. You know, I, I, I'm sure Dan to this day wonders which it was. But, um, you know, it's, it's always been about the empowering side of this. So I, I've been part of tech. Tech's been part of my life since the very beginning. A couple of questions that come out of there. I'm wondering how that colors – your thoughts as you raise your daughters, um, how, <laughs> how you're going to either translate what you learned and the experiences you had so that they have the same accessibility, or is it a case of you letting them, you know, discover what, what they, they're attracted to on their own? Well, as I tell my wife, we're going to know if we did a good job when they're about 35. Um, <laughs> it's going to take till then. I kind of, I kind of view 
my family and the tech we have here kind of like a family out like on a farm or a ranch somewhere who has a couple of guns, more guns than the average American family has because they need to, you know, for security reasons, because when the bear comes, you know, you don't really want to throw a rock at it. And, um, and, and, and when you're on a farm, you know, I got no guns in this house, but you know, if, if you're on the farm and you're on the ranch, you got the guns, the kids learn how to use the stuff. And that's kind of the way I've, I view tech and, and, and my kids. And, and it's been fascinating. So I, I've been training them how to use it, how to filter through it, what to think about it. They don't always necessarily agree. Um, we're a no Snapchat household. That's, that's a big bone of contention right now with my family. Um, but, but we're working through it, but it's been fun because they bring to me insight that I wouldn't see otherwise, yeah. you know, two, two moments crystal clear in my head. Um, I wanted to, um, the kids today, you know, are making a lot of mistakes with, with texting and sexting and, and, you know, they, they make a mistake that, that lasts forever. And I thought, okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to give my kids texting early so they can learn how to use it early. And so that I can remind them for about three or four years, that dad has a copy of everything you do. Never needed to go in and look at it, <laughs> but dad has a copy of everything you do. So, um, right when Google voice came out, you know, Google voice has the texting feature. So they could basically have a virtual texting number. So yep. I gave that to him. And then one year I updated my daughter. I put her on a, on a better iPod or something. And I said, okay, hon, you know, here's your texting. And I gave you email. You know, my daughter goes, why, why do I need email? I said, well, if you have to text more than 132 characters, email me. And she said, if I have to text more than 132 characters, can I just call you? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess you can, being my kid and all. And um, that was one eye opener. And then another one, I remember this one so clearly. We, we got in the car. We're driving away. And I tell my daughter, oh, I forgot the iPod. And she goes, well, what are we going to do? And I said, well, we're, well, we'll listen to radio. And she says, what's radio? Wow. Yeah, exactly. And, and I thought, I thought this, is, this is the chance. This is, this is a story I'm going to be telling for the rest of my life. How do you describe radio to somebody who doesn't know radio? And I said, okay, so radio is kind of like an iPod where somebody else decides the music and the podcast that you listen to. And she says, well, why would we do that? That's so funny. That is the future of new media right there. Why would we do that? And um, so you're right, hon. And um, this is this is where we're going. So 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 we teach them. We talk about it. Um, you know, they're, they're decked out. They got their iPhones. My, my eldest is 16 now. She actually does some work for Colligan.com. She does a little bit of editing, some social media work. Um, my youngest wants to, to get there and she's going to be doing some uh, work for me soon. But um, um, we're a big tech house. And of course, all the families you know, they always call me for advice. They call me for help. Um, and sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's hilariously funny. I, I wish I could do a whole comedy podcast on some of the things parents have believed that their kids have told them about technology issues and that, especially young boys and some of the things that are available on the internet. Um, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating space and it's, it's part of it. But I'll tell you the thing that scares me is I will have a, a good meaning parent ask me, Every time, how is somebody who doesn't do this for a living supposed to be able to know? You know, I don't know. I'm just glad I do it for a living. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a lot to keep up with nowadays. Yeah. You know, my, my how to podcast book, you know, I've never wanted to be the how to podcast guy. I've, I've never wanted to be the how to podcast guy. A, because I think there's people better at it. B, because I've always felt weird when there's all this stuff online about it. Um, but you know, I'd keep getting up on stage and somebody would say, you know, if you want to learn how to podcast, pause your guy. And then they couldn't be, do you have a book? No. You know, what do I do? Well, go to YouTube, you, you know, <laughs> do what I did. It's not that hard. Um, but as I saw, and I spoke to this earlier, more and more people making it complicated, more and more people making it difficult. You know, I thought to myself, what if I could do a just simple book? Um, the first, it's like first 62 pages or something is, is the training part. Everything else is commentary. And um, what's interesting is people read it like, 
how come nobody else has made this easy? You know, how come nobody else has just made it four steps? You know, and and there's different reasons. And some people just love the tech. Some of us just, you know, I nerd out. I geek out. I love the tech. You should see my desk. But sometimes we just want to get the word out, flip on a microphone, you know, even if you're sounding like you're on a submarine, yeah. like <laughs> Jackson said. So, um, but yeah, so, so they're part of it. They have more tech than they should. And, and uh, my wife and I are forever worried about the amount of screen time. But uh, so far, they're good kids. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's one of those things that you can't... Uh, you know, you're trying to the uh, hold. It's like the finger in the dike. You know, you you re- you're you're not gonna anything yeah. you do to try to limit their yeah. accessibility to technology. Yeah. I think just hinders their ability to learn to adapt with it and make mistakes with it. Like we, oh, yeah. we you know, we we made mistakes with earlier forms of technology when we yeah. were younger. You yeah. know, not as advanced. But I think there's an aspect to growing up where you have to figure out and you know stick your hand finger in the flame and, and get yeah. burned and. Yeah. <laughs> Part of learning is, is learning how to make mistakes. Yeah. You know, and we're all going to make mistakes with tech. The question is, are we going to make mistakes, small ones, where mom and dad can help, or are we going to make big, gigantic ones? You know, I, I got a buddy of mine who's like, yeah, my kid's not getting the internet until he leaves the home. Yeah. I'm like, really? You want your kid to have unfiltered, complete access to the internet for the first time ever when they leave the house? Maybe dad needs to sit down with son and put his arm around and go, <laughs> okay, let's get to work. And, um, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. My goal is that they're not afraid. They're not scared. You know, they know right from wrong. Um, they know these places can, can take you dark fast. And at the end though, they do have to make the decision and yeah. the decision won't be made at 18. That's why I make the joke, you know, 35, um, you, you know, by then I, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll start to know who they are. So it's that same, uh, issue with kids drinking i mean and kids yeah. in kids in europe i mean yeah. uh, you, you may have even experienced or seen some of this that you know the french i'm sure start giving their kids to taste the wine at 12 or 13 yeah. or 14 so when they hit college it's not this taboo yeah. thing that they yeah. don't have hands on they yeah, can't get exactly. their hands on exactly i am um um my folks are pretty liberal about it um, um no problems but dealing with military base you had, you had issues and um prom night Prom overseas is always fascinating. Um, took um, my date to France for dinner, which just sounds so impressive. That's awesome. But but you know it was five minutes away. Um, just you know, do you have your passport? Um, corsage passport. Those are the two questions. And um, the restaurant we went to, we had set up. Just wanted to be careful. You know, we asked the guy, hey, if we bring some alcohol-free wine, um, you know, would you do you know cork it for us? And, and he's just like alcohol free wine to the French is like an aberration. It's like from he said he said I'll just give you the wine. Yeah, you know he just did so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta you gotta uh, they gotta know how to handle stuff because it's there. Yeah, you know, and 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 uh, neither kid has expressed much interest in going to a commune after all of this. So they're they're gonna have to learn how to get involved, you know, with this. But slowly, but surely, like right now, my my youngest has an iPhone and she has Wi-Fi here at home. We've got, you know, some basic filtering on, but filtering, anybody who thinks filtering works all the way, doesn't understand filtering. Yeah. Um, you know, but right now she doesn't have data um, out and about, you know, and we're just going to learn how to use the internet at home before we learn how to use the internet at school. You know, now has she figured out every Wi-Fi hotspot between here and there? You bet she has, you know, and, <laughs> but have we realized that and we talked about that and, you know, that's, that's the game. It's the game we play. Yeah. We'll see, she's 35. I guess it's to the extent that you want to be, you know, your own version of Big Brother within your own household. You can put GPS in your kids' cars. And, and I know, like, parents look into that. And uh, we don't have kids yet. We're starting. And I, I imagine if you let your mind go. Oh, it's wacky. Yeah. it's It can get really scary, especially when you know, as someone like you does, that what the potential, you know, doorways that are out there for some really crazy stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, coming back to Germany. How long? How long were you in Germany? I was there fourth grade through twelfth grade. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah, therefore, and then I come back home, and my second year of college, the wall falls in '89. So I just dated myself, and um, as a result, you know, I had to get a political science degree because I mean, the whole world you knew, and the reason you were in Germany was because of the the, the Russians and. It was just crazy. And then I ended up actually in in uh, Portland. My last gig before I started doing this stuff full time 
was I um, I worked with an international consulting firm, and and I shared an office with a a gal from Dresden, which was uh, formerly East Germany. She was my age, and and you know she was learning how much the Americans hated her at the same time I was learning about how much the Russians hated us. And um, yeah, fascinating, fascinating time, place to grow up. And, um, you know, maybe that helped with my limitations, didn't have as much access to things over there. So you got creative. So maybe that's why I'm a podcaster. But um, yeah, it was uh, it, it was a crazy time. Yeah, uh, my wife and I went to uh, Berlin a couple of years ago, so it was it was fascinating to do the tours and to see the wall and ride the wall and and just to understand that there was literally two worlds going on one on one on this side, one on the other side, and and it, they couldn't be more different. It was just fascinating. The more and more you dig into the history, and then you read a lot about it when you're here in the states and in, in your history class. But just to be on the same ground there and to experience it, it's something else. It's it's, it's really just puts a human face oh, on it's it. it's crazy. There is a, um, in Berlin at Checkpoint Charlie, which yep. I'm sure you went through, you know, I went through when it was a checkpoint, not a museum. Um, there was this museum of escapees that, that was, that was built around the Checkpoint Charlie area and it kept getting bigger and bigger and it kind of like they buy the next home, they buy the next home and, and, um, always go through that and, and, and the human experience. What was amazing was for me, the the last exhibit was someone who had been shot to death three days before the wall fell. Mm, yeah, I remember that. You know, and man, I don't want to make a bad timing joke here, but but you, you know, just the the human, yeah, it's just crazy. It's crazy. There's a film. If you're interested in this at all, there, there's a German film called Goodbye Lenin. Okay. Which is it's 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 hard to find, but it is. First of all, the Germans are not known for their yuck fests, um, but this thing is just laugh out loud hilarious. Um, it sounds, a, sounds familiar. It's a German couple or a German family. Mom just lost her husband to a hussy in the West. So she throws herself in all of communism, starts leading the young pioneers. And she and it's right in 89 when things are going crazy. There's some 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 crowd of people she knocks over. She goes into a coma. And so she's in a coma when the West opens up. So her boy becomes a, a, a Burger King manager, you know, it's just the whole thing. And she comes out of the coma and the doctors tell her, tell her kids that if she has any shock to her system, she might go back in the coma again and die. Again, Germans full of yucks. They, they just love their comedy. Um, so these kids have to keep East Germany alive for mom. You know, and oh, hilarity ensues, and it's it, it's. But it was done very authentically, and, and and they dug up the old East German pickles, and there's all these weird subplots. But it's um, yeah, it's it's a crazy time. It's and and to see how fast it all changed, uh, to see how fast it all it, it all turned around, and to know that someone who you know in January ran the Young Pioneers could be running a Burger King in in, in December is just just absolutely crazy. And all this pre-web and pre-internet. And pre, yeah, of course. You know, you know, imagine 89 if we'd had Facebook and Twitter and those things. Yeah. So, I mean, 4th through 12th, those are pretty formative years. I'm wondering yep. what was one of your fondest memories of Germany? I, so many. The big thing, my dad is a teacher. Um, we explored Europe during holidays. Yeah. Including most of the summer. So we had all these crazy tourism um, um, moments. I remember one, <laughs> this is maybe not the, the biggest memory, but it's just kind of the life we led. Uh, we went to Rome for spring break. Because um, so that's, that's what morning, you do. What? Because that's what you do, right? That's what you do. <laughs> and so we got up one morning to go explore Rome, and we decided this would be the day that we'd see St. Peter's. And, and um, there were a lot of people there. And uh, we knew St. Peter's was popular, but there are a lot of people there. And then we realized it was Easter Sunday. <laughs> oh, man. And so we just did the whole thing, and Pope Mobile drives by, and, you know, there we are. So, um, you know, we're on spring break. You don't necessarily keep, especially when you're camping and that kind of thing. So so I saw the Europe that um, most people don't see, you know, and um, that was fun. What, what was really weird was um, we um, – the military, and I don't know if the base is still there, there was a military base in Vincenza, Italy, which was uh, near Pisa, the old Leaning Tower of Pisa. And um, the base had a campground 
So we would camp there. Um, but of course, across the street from the campground is the commissary and the PX and, and, and the bowling alley and the movie theater. And then the base had a shovel every day to this little slice of beach we had, you know, on, on, you know, in the Mediterranean. So we would, uh, we would summer in Italy, you know, <laughs> if you will, for, you know, three or $4 a night kind of thing. And, and it was, um, it, it was, it was crazy. And there was a, in the town that the beach was at, there was an arcade and on the military base, you don't get a lot of video games. I mean, video games back, that was the food in the eighties and, and you went where they were. And the exchange rate back then basically made video games about a dime. Mm. It's crazy. So a, when you, when you don't have them and then suddenly they're a dime, yeah. the Germans kind of regulated them like gambling machines. Like a lot of times you can play a video, you could drink all the beer you wanted to at 13, but play a video game, forget it. And, um, so we'd play in this arcade in this old Italian town and the guy had three rows of games, but he only had two circuits. And so every once in a while, based on who wanted to play what, he'd unplug a whole row and just give you your money back, you know, but, but, but you'd be on a rager on defender, you know, you'd be ready for the high score and, and, uh, it went away. And, and so that was, um, but that'd be my summer, you know, and it seemed normal to me, you know, and, and my dad would go have a cappuccino and mom would poor lady would take a nap in the tent. You know? <laughs> the, I, I'm wondering how that colors, you know, as, as, you know, coming back to your, your kids again, if it's important for you, uh, to, to have some aspect where you're introducing them to new cultures and new experiences and how important travel is to you. Definitely. Uh, they, they love to travel. They want to travel back to this whole mantra. Both of them wanted to go. You know, and, um, and, and, and logistically, you know, at that point it was so odd that, that I wasn't quite ready for something like that. But, um, if I go back, I could see taking one of them they, they love to explore. I, I, I've definitely given them that, um, they haven't been to Europe yet. We're, we're, we're still waiting, um, to boy, when your parents are there and they have an apartment and they have a car and they have, you know, tax free gas and access to a commissary, it's a lot cheaper than when you actually have to pay for everything yourself, <laughs> Yeah, you know, a little bit. And, and um, so um, they, they want to explore. We've done the East Coast. We, we've done Boston. We, we've done s some other places. And uh, but but Europe's Europe's the next big trip. But they have a hunger for it. Uh, they love to explore. Mm -hmm. And uh, they love to explore technically. They love to explore artistically. They love to explore <laughs> physically. And um, yeah, yeah, they're they're you know they they would uh, they would spend all the summers abroad if uh, you know. But again, you know when you go when you go and fly economy class for one ticket and stay at your folks house it's pretty cheap once you once you buy four and you got to buy the apartment and boy yeah. the exchange rates over there right now are terrible yeah so the the math on that changes a little bit yep do you remember the the, the date of your first podcast nope <laughs> i really should i should have it there was an article that came out a couple of weeks ago somebody had a huge collection of podcasts from the early days and sent them all to the internet archive and I was so excited. I went in there and typed Paul Call again to get something from my past and nothing. Hmm. What was the first show? Um, it was Marketing Online Live. Yeah. And Marketing Online Live and then Podcast Tools I did. And then I did a show called Profitable Podcasting. And um, th th those were the big three um, um, originally. And uh, yeah, I wish I had those. I'm sure there's some hard drive somewhere that has them. And they're probably terrifying to listen to, but I, I think they'd be fascinating. They're like old pictures of high school, you know? I think nowadays more people are being conscious of the archival aspect yeah. of podcasting. You've got, you know, um, it was archive.org um, where a lot of people are sending their shows. So I think yep. now they're, they're sort of getting hit to that, but hopefully some of those old, old ones can be re resurrected. Yeah, somebody somewhere has got to have a hard drive. Yeah. Um, tell me the story about your outro music. I'm, I'm really digging it. I, I'm, I'm getting uh, touches of uh, Preservation Hall jazz band for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, well, truth be told, it's one of the free downloads from uh, from the YouTube archive. You know, they have a bunch of uh, music that you can that you can use, and I grabbed that from there. I, it's so funny because I think people go with the standard sounds of like, you know, these motivational uh, oh, yeah. clips or something like that. So y yours stands out because, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I don't listen to every single podcast out there and all their outro musics. But when something is, is good, it just catches your ear. And I, and I, and I really like the, the energy that that portrays. Thanks. Thanks. It's it just, you know, let's let's have fun with this, for goodness sakes, you know. And, and but at the same time, let's not do, you know, those podcasts with those. You know, those thirty-minute podcast with a two and a half minute intro. <laughs> you know, let's let's keep these short. 
I, I was once there was a guy here in town. I don't know if he's still podcasting, and I heard about him. I heard how important he was. All of his press releases and stuff. I listened to his show, and it was like this ongoing stinger with just explosion, explosion, and you, you know, you know, left, right changes, and 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 after about a minute. I thought he was a parody of the whole thing, you know, and, and, and so he kept going and going. And then it was like the show when he was trying to be real and, and, you know, there's a band, you ever heard of um, Over the Rhine? Over the Rhine? No. Over the Rhine is a singer songwriter, um, husband, wife combo. They, they have a, they have a fascinating, fascinating history. Great in concert, great show. Um, they, did the big record thing for a little while, got themselves into some trouble, lost their contract, lost a lot of things, um, recorded a couple of albums in their basement by themselves. Um, and they went like two, three years without recording something. And all the fans were like, what's going on? What's going on? And, and then, um, Karen, the, the, the lead singer, she, she breaks out the piano. And the first song is, uh, first lyrics were, I don't want to waste your time with music. You don't need. <laughs> you know, and uh, what it was was we didn't have anything to say. You know, we didn't want to, and I just I dug that, and and I've tried to, I've tried to do that in podcasting. I've tried to do that with with with, with training, and and sometimes we have some obligations to delivery and stuff. But but um, I, I don't want to waste your time. So you know, I I found a jazz snippet that that I could do really quickly in and out, get the groove, get the excitement, and then get back to work. Yeah, it works. It it, it definitely it carries the enthusiasm of the show through. Um, do you have a, um, a relationship that stands out uh, with a past mentor or teacher who's had an impact on your life? Oh, gosh. Um, I've, I've got a lot. Um, um, I'll go with someone recent. Um, Mike, Mike Keenigs is a he, – he, he's an interesting character. He has the company Traffic Guys or an instant customer. I went to go work for him for a little while. And um, Mike – I had tremendous respect for me and where I came from, and I had tremendous respect for him and where he came from. But but Mike was far, still is, and still a good friend, uh, a far better businessman than I am. And M Mike said once, and this was so key, and it haunts me to this day. He said, you know, Paul, if you took all that energy you took on writing off your toys and building a business that lets you get stuff for free, if you took all that energy and just spent that on making money, you wouldn't have to worry about writing off your toys and getting stuff for free, you know? And so Mike was always the, the business side of it. And some maybe will, will criticize him that it's too much the business side, but, but, but it allowed me to be free and artistic and crazy while, while he was worrying about those things, you know? And, and I think it's important to surround yourself with, with the other sides of the story. Yeah. You know, the best book I ever read, um, about business, about any, about podcasting. There's a book called The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Yeah. You, you know, and his whole thing is any organization needs three types, the dreamer, the doer, and the administrator. And basically, you're really good at one, you're okay at the other one, and then you got to find somebody else to do the third thing. You know, and we see this in podcasting because we, we got guys who, who have, you know, um, you, you know, 14 moleskin catalogs of all the podcasts they're going to launch one day. You know, you know, they're, they're the dreamer, but they have a hard time doing it. You know, they have the people who are ready to podcast, but they got nothing to podcast about, you know, and then you got the people who spend all day long comparing Fraunhofer compression codex, <laughs> you know, because the, 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 um, administrative side of it's all there and, and you gotta, you gotta get the combo of the three. So I'm a dreamer. What can we do? Where can we go? I'll do it, but I need somebody to kind of run the spreadsheets and um, where's the money going to come from? How are we going to pay the bills? That kind of stuff so that I can have daughters that I, I can buy iPhones for, you know, and, and that type of thing. I think of the podcasting space, it's it's been funny because there's this battle that I, I don't know who created it, but there's this battle about is it okay to make money in podcasting and should yeah. you make money in podcasting? Is is monetization the right model? And it's it's so funny because – there's this feeling almost as if podcasting holds some strange m intrinsic moral position in, in, in the universe. And the, the analogy I always like to come up with is I have no doubt in my mind that the greatest marinara sauce in the world is made by some grandma somewhere in some dark home somewhere with a family of maybe 11, you know, and, and they're treated to empirically the world's finest marinara sauce. 
but I'm really glad that the Italian restaurant down the street is willing to sell me some, yeah. <laughs> you know, because I too like marinara. And, you know, in, 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 in podcasting, those who do this as a hobby and as fun, God bless them. Those who want to make a living from it, God bless them, you, you know, but it's, it's, you want someone to work through that. So, so, so that, that's what Mike has done. And that's what, what Mike has taught me. And uh, we, uh, he sold his company and uh, had, had no more need for me. And, and so I, I, he and I departed ways, um, um, you know, contractually, but, but we still get to get together and hang out on a fairly regular basis. I think that's so important because it's, you know, podcasting then substitute any other creative endeavor. And it's, it's a, it's a conversation that probably goes back to the Renaissance, or I don't oh, know, sure. maybe even before, like there's no reason or there's nothing that says that you can't be compensated for doing things that, that you're passionate about and, yeah. and, and podcasting is no different. Exactly. Um, what have you changed your mind about recently? <sighs> oh boy, a lot. Um, Well, w- one thing happened lately on the show. Um, you've noticed lately I've been building the episode around a giveaway yep. that I'm asking people to, to download. Now, I say this as today's episode will not have that. Um, but um, I've, I've been really pulling for, for the email address because um, th- there, there, there's two levels to this. A... You know, I make the money in the email. You know, I'm, I'm not the guy who's going to make a money from a big check from GoDaddy for, you know, sponsoring my, my, my show. It's going to be the larger stuff, the consulting gigs, that type of thing. But but there's a bit of a service um, w- w- when you can pass the podcast. You know, you know, the thing is, you've downloaded four or five of my giveaways recently. S- other people have. You know, there are a couple of them that have shot through the roof in popularity. There are a couple of them that have um, got maybe one or two downloads. And which has been really, really amazing. But now I know what my audience is really interested in. Mm -hmm. And by doing this process, by building a a bit more formulaic, I now have an email list of people interested in very specific topics. And from there, I can can match them with products and services that make more sense to them there. And so in the past, been a bit more freewheeling. Now it's it's a bit more more specific, and maybe that's Mike speaking to me. But but I I, I think that's the next step. I think it goes back to the um, I don't want to waste your time with music you don't need. You know I, yeah. I don't want someone. I, I do a lot of public speaking, and people come and say, "Man, you are hilarious." You know you should think about you know being a stand up comic. Well, well, thank you, and 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 I definitely try to be entertaining. But please, for the love of God, tell me that you didn't fly all the way to Dallas to see a second rate stand up comic you know ho- hopefully there's something in this for you and and in your business you know so i have lately been collecting emails which is fairly new to me specifically collecting not the come by join my email list kind of thing but specifically collecting emails marketing to them um um that is going to be a big change and then um video podcasting i think it's going to be part of that i've been doing some video experiments and um I think video is is the next step pretty quickly. Um, the new Apple TV with the universal search yeah. is is really interesting. And I think I prefer audio. Um, if I had my choice, I'd be all audio podcast. But video has a perceived value to it. So I think a video podcast available in universal search that when somebody sits down, they can find me not necessarily as a podcast, but as a piece of content. I think that's going to be important. I think that's going to be really important. So uh, the collective email addresses um, has been a big mind change. And and I think um, my next step in video. Yeah, I totally agree on video. And I, I think you even alluded to it in when you talked about Instagram and how they, uh, you can down do the 30 second videos and, and you're, yep. I, I, I recommend people listen to that. There's some good tips you're giving about how to get your video distribution strategy coordinated. So uh, I, I think we have a lot to see there and Apple is probably well, going to play a big role I, in that. I think Apple will help. And speaking of that, I actually have to jump over to Facebook. I'm going to try my first um, video recording on, on, on the Facebook Live in the next episode of the podcast. So cool. I'll we'll, make sure we'll I'll, see how that goes. I'll make sure I check that out. So what is the best place for, for uh, folks to track you down? Best place is the podcastreport.com right now. 
Okay. Um, that's the best way to do it. If you sign up for one of the giveaways, you'll, you'll be on the email list. You'll see what I'm offering. And, you know, if you don't buy, I don't get offended. If you unsubscribe, I don't get offended. You, you know, it's, it's, that's just the machine. Um, my book had a podcast. It's, it's, it's two ninety nine at Amazon these days. So if, if, if you want a little easy reference point, that's there as well, but then register the book. Um, um email is still King for me. Yeah. Well, Paul, thank you so much. I'm so happy we finally got a chance to catch yeah, up. I appreciate you taking the time and I uh, look forward to catching you on Facebook Live pretty soon. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, take care and have a yeah. fantastic day. Thank you. So for those of you that didn't know who Paul was, I, I trust that you learned a little bit more about him and got a taste for just how entertaining and informative and wise um, he is. Uh, I think... The fact that he's been doing this for so long, that he's such a proponent of teaching people um, about podcasting, um, and he does it in a way that's not condescending at all, and he does it in a way where he really wants you to learn uh, and understand how easy it is to podcast if you just focus on the essentials, and too many people get caught up in getting every aspect of their podcast launch right, and inevitably they don't launch. And I think uh, what Paul is doing is, is great. I think he's got uh, a unique perspective, having done this for such a long time, being such an advocate um, and an early proponent of technology. The, the, the book that he mentioned on the history of the internet, I think that it was. Uh, <laughs> that must be a fascinating read, especially in, in this day and age. And, and we also talked about his, um, his thoughts on, on how technology and, and the use of it is is going to color how he chooses to raise his daughters. So all in all, um, it went by quick. And uh, like I mentioned at the top of the the show, again, he's one of those guys that we could just talk ad nauseum about a specific topic. And uh, I'm really happy we got to, to finally connect. We've been seeing each other online. And um, it's just one of those veteran podcasters that I, that I knew I needed to get on the show. So I'm really happy that I did. So uh, Podcast Junkies is a proud member of Podcastica. You can check out all the great shows that we have at podcastica.com. And um, the intro and outro music is provided by my friends Cedar and Soil. You can check his music out at cedarsoil.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. Head on over to podcastjunkies.com slash 86, where we put together the full detailed show notes of everything Paul and I spoke about, the links that were mentioned, some uh, tweetables that you can capture. Uh, again, uh, so, so you can capture the the um, the moments from, of, of things that we talked about. And we put a bit of time into those. So if you can, go in there, leave some comments, um, and give us some feedback on what you're liking or what you're not uh, about the episode or about the show. Um, don't forget, as always, you can subscribe at podcastjunkies.com slash iTunes. And if you haven't yet, please leave a rating and review. I know people hear this week in and week out, and I bet you there's people who still have yet to do that. So uh, Podcast Junkies is brought to you this week by Fancy Hands, an online concierge service where you can get uh, a variety of tasks done. Most that take 20 minutes or less are included uh, they are my go-to source for anything that I need help with um, and where I want to sort of farm out um, tasks where someone can jump on a phone or needs a little bit of research or needs to book an appointment for me. I've been a fan for three years and they've give, graciously given me some codes to use for listeners of this show. So if you head on over to uh, iTunes and you leave a review or Stitcher, if you are not a uh, Mac or Apple fanboy, then you can leave a review there. Just put a hashtag in of fancy hands and I'll be reviewing those. And every every month I'll give away the uh, five the five tasks that Fancy Hands has provided to us. You can check them out at fancyhands.com. Can't say enough of, uh, good things about those folks. Um, stay tuned for next week's episode where we talk to a video podcaster. His name is Andrew Locke and I met him at a a uh, conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. Fascinating stuff, and he has a really interesting story. I think you're going to get a lot out of it, like you did this episode. If you made it this far, then it's because you're looking for the retention hashtag. It's actually Berlin Paul. So it's a play on Berlin Wall. We talked about Germany. It's Paul Culligan. So 
Hashtag Berlin, Paul, B-E-R-L-I-N, P-A-U-L. If you made it this far, tag podcast underscore junkies and tag at Colligan, C-O-L-L-I-G-A-N. That's uh, Paul's Twitter handle. Let us know you made it this far and what you thought of the episode. Thanks again for spending some time with me. It is uh, truly appreciated. I definitely uh, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you, specifically listening right here, right now. And uh, I just mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thanks again for listening and supporting the show. Anything you can do to spread the word is greatly appreciated. Have a fantastic week, guys. (laughs) 